Thank you. I am great because this is my passion. A child's success depends on me. My determination will not allow me to fail them. You are great because this is your passion. Some child's success depends on you. And your determination will not allow you to fail them. I hope you heard those words as I opened up. I'd like to first say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be in your presence this afternoon. It is truly a joy to be amongst colleagues who are doing this hard work. By the time I step off the stage this afternoon, I hope that you'll see that I am a reflection of you. I'm a reflection of you because I am extremely passionate about the work that I'm doing. I find it not only my calling, but my purpose to be a catalyst for students to be successful in and out of the classroom. This afternoon, I'm not gonna wow you with any statistics, any uh, intense strategies that you're gonna use because my personal opinion is that the majority of you, you already have everything that you need to help students be successful. And if you don't, through the course of this week's training, you're gonna gain that. My goal this afternoon is to do accomplish three things. First, to restore your confidence in yourselves and help you to realize that you are great teachers, great educators, great educational leaders, not because of what you know or what you can do, but because you realize that this is more than just a job, it's a calling. Secondly, I wanna make sure that we all understand that a child's success is dependent upon us. We do determine a child's success. And then lastly, I just want you to walk away motivated and inspired to carry forth this work. Motivated and inspired to reach and teach each and every single child that you come encounter with. As stated, my name is Michael Giles. I'm not going to go over my, my, my bio again, but I just do want to make note of the fact that this is my fourth year as an, fifth year as an assistant principal at a national AVID demonstration school. I strongly believe in the AVID program, and as I go through my speech with you this afternoon, you'll understand why. Prior to being an assistant principal, I was a counselor, I was a dean, and prior to coming into education, I was a juvenile corrections counselor. And my only purpose for sharing that is that I want you to realize that I have worked with kids in all of my professional occupational career. Now, as I was preparing my message for you today, I was wishing that I had some sort of triumphant story, how I overcame some obstacles, um, went through all kind of adversity. You know, we hear those stories and we get so inspired, and I appreciate those stories. But I have to be honest with you, that's not my story. For the most part, I had a pretty smooth academic uh, career. You know, I had my fair share of bumps and bruises, just as each and every one of us in this room today have. But for the most part, I had a pretty smooth academic career. And I attribute that to two specific factors. The first, my parents. Thank God for my parents. You know, they taught me at a very early age to appreciate education. They made me appreciate learning and how far I could go in life by being a, long, a learner. And as great parents do, they provided access and opportunity for me to do well in and out of school. So I thank my parents for that. Secondly, I thank two specific teachers. In my primary years, I was fortunate to experience Sister Roberta and Mrs. Florence J. Mitchell. And I wish they were here today. I'm not sure where they are, but. Um, they laid the foundation for my academic journey. See, Sister Roberta was my third grade teacher, all right? And she taught, she was my third grade teacher at St. Jude's Catholic School, which, which was a small Catholic school in the heart of Sumter, South Carolina, in a really low-income neighborhood. And if my memory serves me well, the school was so small that first through fourth grade all went to school together in one classroom. So that's a small school. Sister Roberta made a huge impression on me from the very start, though. She was from New York City, and my family, we're from New York also. So her and my parents had this immediate connection. And I can remember on the first day of school, my mother grabbed my arm and she grabbed Sister Roberta's arm. Now mind you, Sister Roberta stood maybe 4'7", 4'8", maybe. She had this salt and pepper jerry curl. You guys know the jerry curl? Uh-huh. She had the big bubble frame glasses that you used to wear in the 80s. Some of y'all used to wear those glasses. You know what I'm talking about. 
But she was, a, she was an imposing figure all the same. But I remember my mother grabbing her arm and my mother grabbed my arm. And she said, I want you to look at this woman right here. This woman right here is my homegirl. And I told her, if you give her any problems in the classroom, she can beat you behind first. <laughs> and then call me, and I'm going to beat you behind when you get home. <laughs> you talk about good parenting. <laughs> But that aside, I got to tell you why I really pre appreciated Sister Roberta. From day one, she showed me, not just told me, but she showed me that I was smart. She showed me that I was special, that I was somebody, that I had something to give in her classroom. Her words and daily actions, she made me feel like I was someone important. And see, I got to tell you, this is a change. You know, I talked in the beginning about the bumps and bruises. This is a change of my academic experience because first grade and part of second grade, the school that I went to, I was a quiet kid. I had some nervous habits. And um, the teacher told my mother that I was slow, slow developmentally, and I was behind all the other kids. Now, in my heart, I knew differently, and my mother knew differently, because she had me reading and doing all kinds of things at home, but it just didn't manifest at school. And because I was shy and quiet, she felt, the teacher felt, that I was slow and uh, behind all the other students. So to make a long story short, I'm not going to share with you all the details, but my mother fought the school, and then she decided to pull me out and put me in another school. And that's where I found Sister Roberta. Um, I'd venture to say that when I was in Sister Roberta's class, you know, I was no smarter than the other students in the classroom. But at any rate, she made me feel like I was. I remember how proud I used to be to come to her classroom, so much that I would work extra hard every single day to prove her right. That positive reinforcement and positive encouragement that she gave me built the foundation of my academic self-esteem. I told you I was a shy kid, had some nervous habits. I didn't have that academic self-esteem. I want you guys to marinate on that word because it's hugely important. That's why a lot of our kids today are failing because they don't have that academic self-esteem. Now, I don't want to make it sound like Sister Roberta was all fluff because I can recall many a day she'd have me go home in tears because she challenged me. She pushed me to the point of tears. She had extremely high expectations. We talk about high expectations all the time. But because she took that time from the very beginning to make me feel that I was smart, to tell me how important and how much I had to offer, I felt an obligation to respond to her expectations on a daily basis. And I thank Sister Roberta for that. Now, by the end of my third grade year, my father received orders to move to Warner Robins, Georgia. My father was in the military. And this is where I would eventually encounter Mrs. Florence J. Mitchell. Now, Florence J. Mitchell was different from Sister Roberta. You got Sister Roberta at 4'7". Florence J. Mitchell stood at what I think about 7'6". <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and she, had, she didn't have the pearl, but she, I mean the curl, but she had a little afro going on. And Mrs. Mitchell had this, I mean, she, she, <laughs> she, first of all, she wore this dress every single, not this dress, but a dress every single day. <laughs> And it was either black or blue, long flowy dress. She wore high two, three inch heels with pointy tips. And she had this walk about her. I don't know, you know, these young kids today, they call it swag. But I got to show you how Miss Mitchell used to walk. <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm flying. I'm serious. Every single day, that's how she used to walk in the front of the class. But Miss Mitchell had this, she was imposing but elegant. And she had this, this personality about her. And I can recall on one of the first days of school, Mrs. Mitchell came with her walk, stopped right in the middle of the class, and she said, I graduated from Fort Valley State College, and each of you will someday go to college and graduate too. Wow. Wow. Now, I know my parents had talked to me many a times about college, but never had they made a proclamation that, Michael, you are going to college and you will graduate. That teacher spoke, spoke breath into my life. From that point forward, I knew I was going to Fort Valley State. <laughs> I didn't know anything about any other school in the nation, but I was going to Fort Valley. The funny part is, all I knew you did at college was play football or basketball, but I was going to Fort Valley State. But the, the, the reality is, Ms. Mitchell had high expectations for us also academically. But not only academically, but for the way that we carried ourselves as individuals. She exuded a certain pride in who she was and how people perceived her. And she was very intentional 
about the way she modeled pride and excellence for us. She was a model for us. And when me and some of the boys used to sit in the back of the classroom or in the front of the classroom and goof off like sixth grade boys do, Mrs. Mitchell would come up and get close in our face and she would say, you are not a fool. You are intelligent. You are a leader. And I expect you to act that way. And I'll be doggone if I didn't straight up right after that, straighten up right after that. But then she would always follow it up with a huge hug and she would tell us how much she loved us too. So first she would scare us, then she would love us. It worked. <laughs> but to phrase it another way, Mrs. Mitchell challenged me also. She made, and I do mean, she made me participate in several things in speech. She made me participate in spelling contests, essay contests. She was constantly pushing me to do more and to challenge myself. I can still hear her saying, she would make us come in after school, and I can still hear her standing in the back of the classroom, and she would say, hold your head up, project your voice. You have something important to say, and we need to hear it. And you know, as I look back on it, I'm realizing what she was doing was validating my voice. Remember I talked about the academic self-esteem. I'm gonna tell you also, a lot of our kids are failing because they aren't being validated. They don't, their voice has not been validated. So I thank Mrs. Mitchell for that. As I grew older and matriculated through high school, I didn't have Mrs. Mitchell or Sister Roberta around. I did fairly well though. I maintained about a 3.2 GPA, um, exceeded in football, basketball, and track. I had a pretty good career. Um, in fact, but it, as, I, as I look back on that, even though it was a good career, I ended up going to college, finishing uh, in four years. I, I look back on it, I know Ms. Mitchell would have been disappointed in me. And as, as I'm mature enough now, and I look back on it, I'm a little disappointed in myself because when I was in high school, I didn't take advantage of all the opportunities. I didn't push myself as hard as I was pushed or I pushed myself when I was in my primary years, you see. I didn't take any advanced placement courses. I didn't take any college prep courses. During football season, I only went to school full-time during the season, and after the season, I went to school half-time, my senior year. You see, so I wasn't really challenging myself. And no one, not even my counselor, who, taught, who at the time I thought was giving me good advice, told me to step out there and challenge myself. No one really pumped college from an academic readiness perspective to me. As I look back and I think about it, and, and, and it's not a conviction, but I think most of the adults around me were pretty content that I had decent grades, I was a pretty good athlete, and I'd probably secure a scholarship on that merit, which I did. However, I wish that I had that one person. I wish that I had a teacher, a counselor, one of my coaches, a janitor, somebody to pull me aside, sit me down and say, Mike, you're doing fine, but you can do even better. Why don't you take an AP class? Why don't you sign up for this? Why don't you run for student government? Demonstrate your leadership abilities. Prepare yourself to get out in this world and compete. Prepare yourself not just to get to college, but to get through college. I didn't have that. Fortunately, I did okay, but what about the kids that didn't have the structure that I had, had at home, or the foundation I had early on? Um, now, I don't want you to misconstrue my story as a conviction or an indictment on other teachers or adults in my secondary education, because it's not that at all. Uh, you know, I take full ownership of my, my, my academic progress or anywhere that I feel like I may have lacked that. But I can't help but asking what if? What if I had somebody in high school? What if I had a Mrs. Mitchell or Sister Roberta when I was in high school? How far could I have gone? What if there's somebody in some of your classes right now just waiting for a teacher to tap their potential? I have to share this with you briefly. 10 years ago when I came into education, I was blessed to have the opportunity to work with a young, vibrant, avid coordinator teacher by the name of Miss Maria Cobb. <laughs> you hear the cheers up front because Miss Maria Cobb is one of AVID's national um, directors of divisional support. Maria, can you stand or to throw your hands up please? <laughs> Thank you. As I was the avid counselor at this time, I would visit Maria's classroom and watch her work her magic quite often. 
Marie embodied all the characteristics of a sister Roberta or a Mrs. Mitchell, minus the jerry curl, the seven foot, and the heels. But she was all right. <laughs> she was a perfect model of that teacher that I felt that I was missing in my secondary education. You can only imagine how she was in the classroom if you know her. She was a motivator, a believer in her students, a believer in her own ability to reach each and every student. And she never let, she always set high expectations and never let the kids settle for anything less than their best. These characteristics coupled with her instructional skill set made her the type of teacher that I wish that I had for myself and I would put my child in that class in any day. So I thank Maria for that opportunity for me to be reintroduced to that type of a teacher as well as this avid system. Now I told you in the beginning that I wanted to do a couple of things. The first thing I wanted to restore your ability, your confidence in your ability to reach and teach each and every child that you come into contact with. I told you that you are great because you are passionate about kids. When the workload gets heavy, the students are resistant, parents seem to lack interest or support, and your administrator is on your back about getting kids to demonstrate growth and performance on that standardized assessment, you have to take your mind back to the place that caused you to come back, come into this profession. You see, I'm going to tell you, we all have different stories of how we got here, but I venture to say that we share similar stories as to why we're here. And I venture to say it's because we thought at some point in time that we could reach and improve the life of some child as someone possibly did for us. And I'm here to tell you that we can and we do. Each of, in this, each of us in this room can recall at least one testimony of a teacher who has changed or impacted their life. See, too often we get lost in what's not going well or the things that we cannot control. And I'm here to tell you to start focusing on the things that you can control. I want everybody to humor me for a second, okay? We've been together for maybe six, seven minutes. You can trust me, all right? What I need everybody to do is to close your eyes. I feel like I'm in church under the sound of my voice. I need everyone to close your eyes, please. And as you hear my voice, I want you to take yourself, I want you to think about a student that you have positively impacted in your life or a child that you've made a positive impact on. And as you identify that person, if you would softly just stand in front of your seat, just stand with your eyes closed, just stand. Now, I know some of you don't follow directions well because I see some pupils, but that's okay. Open your eyes and look around, top to bottom. Look around. Do you see the power in this room? Do you see that each of us is touching somebody? Each of us is making an impact on a child's life. And if you're sitting down, I challenge you that either one, I didn't give you enough time to identify that story, but if that's not the case and you're still sitting, I'd ask you to look around you and identify one or two people that are standing and ask them if they'll share their story with you before you leave here today. Thank you. You can have a seat. Secondly, I said that I wanted to make sure that we all understood that student success is related to teacher beliefs and mindsets, to our expectations. See, I'm a firm believer that much of our achievement gap exists because of our, our beliefs and our expectations, conscious and subconscious. If I were to ask everyone in this room to raise their hand if they thought that all kids could achieve, I'm sure, I'm sure just about every single hand would go up. But now if I were to ask, if I were to ask you if you felt that you personally had the ability and the skill to positively impact the lives of a child or the children that come into your classroom. I'm pretty sure that a good majority of the room would still be sitting on their hands. Excuse me, I'm sorry. In one of our, in our CEO Culture Responsive Teaching Strands, we really talk about this, ex, this, this idea of expectations and the fact that having high expectations for kids is vital, it's essential. But more importantly, what are your expectations for yourself as the educator? 
Because if you have those expectations for yourself that you will not allow a child to fail, then you'll work hard every single day, every single day to make sure that you're giving yourself the skills, that you're finding different ways, you're identifying the resources to reach those, uh, those children who it may seem difficult to reach in the beginning. Now, as I wrap this up, I'd like to share a letter that was written to an avid teacher by a former student. I'm not going to give you the background on this story because um, we've heard this story before, and I don't think that's the necessary piece. In my opinion, the necessary piece is what this kid had to say. But I just will, I will tell you this, that this child was dealt a, a, a pretty harsh hand in life. And um, many kids that have been dealt the same hand have either dropped out of school, um, ended up on drugs, or just not fared very well. But I want to share this letter that this child wrote back to his avid teacher. And I'm not going to give the name or the name of the teacher, but it says, Dear Mrs. X, I have been given an opportunity to honor someone that has a major impact on my educational life. When I was a student, you really showed me the importance of succeeding in school. You helped me learn that even the little things like being unorganized can have a huge effect on my performance in school. Also, when I was struggling with my grades, you brought me into your classroom and helped me bring them up. I also wanted to thank you for not letting me slide or get by easily. You were hard on me and disciplined me well so that I could succeed. This helped me to learn that when you struggle, the only way to get better is to work hard and to be de determined. This lesson made me more independent and now I, have, I don't have to depend on others. So I would like to thank you for all these lessons that I still use today and definitely has had a major impact on my life. Thank you. And that's from a former AVID student. And I'm here to tell you that this kid, like I said, he had a, a, a very harsh upbringing. But this kid is in his third year in college and doing extremely well and plans to go on to get his master's. That's a success story. You see, I read that to share with you, we are making a positive impact in the lives of our children. The AVID system is a catalyst for student growth and success. And as you journey through this week and engage in this fabulous training, I want you to do it with enthusiasm and confidence. I want you to look at each new strategy through the lens of how am I gonna use this to impact the life of my children, to improve the lives of my children. And if at any point you should come across any moment of doubt, or fatigue, as you know we do, we often incur that. I wanna leave you with this quick prayer to get you re-energized. And this is a prayer that someone sent to me that I felt is, is, is germane to the work we do. It says, dear God, please untie the knots that are in my mind, my heart and my life. Remove the have nots, the can nots that I have in my mind. Erase the will nots, the may nots, might nots that may find a home in my heart. Release me of the could nots, the would nots, and the should nots that obstruct my life. And most of all, I ask that you remove from my mind, my heart and my life, all of the am nots that I have allowed to hold me back, especially the thought that I am not good enough. And I'm here to tell you, each and every single one of you in this room are more than good enough, more than qualified to reach the children. So as I close, I need a little bit of help from the crowd. I'd like you to repeat after me. I open with this and I wanna close with it. And if you'll repeat after me. We are great because this is our passion. A child's future depends on us. Our determination will not allow us to fail them. Okay, one more time with a little energy. We are great because our passion. A child's future depends on us. And our determination will not allow us to fail them. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week. Stay encouraged, stay motivated. Thank you for your time.